Good afternoon, Skillman Church of Christ. Welcome to the midweek message that we are putting out uh, every Wednesday. I'm excited about today because uh, today we will be concluding a sermon series that started uh, a few months ago called Live by Faith. When we started the year out in 20, well, January of 2020, we kind of laid out a vision for the year. We broke up the year into three specific um, seasons, uh, months, uh, where we were going to speak about a specific topic within our mission and vision of the year. Uh, we are striving as a community of faith to be uh, Christians, disciples of Jesus, that uh, live by faith, that advocate hope, and that are known by love. And so for the first part of the year, we really wanted to focus all of the teaching and the preaching and the classes on that theme of living by faith. What does it look like to be a person of faith? How how can we be faithful in today's world? Uh, what does what is how do you define faith? And so, uh, as part of that, we looked specifically in this sermon series on Hebrews chapter eleven, and we looked at this particular text and really tried to look verse by verse and story by story of examples of how faith is played out. So uh, today we're going to conclude that series. Uh, we're going to finish up this particular sermon series on a Wednesday night. And I've enlisted a little help from my uh, friends. Uh, many of you know uh, Judy Teague. She is just a, an angel on earth. Uh, and she is going today, we're, she's going to read the entire chapter. So uh, to begin this message, we'll have Judy read uh, Hebrews chapter 11 the, at its entirety. And so at this time to begin, just sit back and relax and uh, listen to Judy Teague uh, reading Hebrews chapter 11. Hebrews 11. Now faith is the reality of what is hoped for, the proof of what is not seen. For by it our ancestors won God's approval. By faith we understand that the universe was created by the word of God, so that what is seen was made from things that are not visible. By faith, Abel offered to God a better sacrifice than Cain did. By faith, he was approved as a righteous man because God approved his gifts. And even though he is dead, he still speaks through his faith. By faith, Enoch was taken away, and so he did not experience death. He was not to be found because God took him away. For before he was taken away, he was approved as one who pleased God. Now without faith, it is impossible to please God since the one who draws near to him must believe that he exists and that he rewards those that seek him. By faith Noah, after he was warned about what was not yet seen and motivated by godly fear, built an ark to deliver his family. By faith he condemned the world and became an heir of the righteousness that comes by faith. By faith Abraham, when he was called, obeyed and set up for a place that he was going to receive as an inheritance. He went out even though he did not know where he was going. By faith he stayed as a foreigner in the land of promise, living in tents as did Isaac and Jacob, co-heirs of the same promise. For he was looking forward to the city that has foundations, whose architect and builder is God. By faith even Sarah herself, when she was unable to have children, received power to conceive offspring, even though she was past the age since she considered that the one who had promised was faithful. Therefore, from one man, in fact from one as good as dead, came offspring as numerous as the stars of the sky and innumerable as the grains of sand along the seashore. All these died in faith, although they had not received the things that were promised, but they saw them from a distance, greeted them, and confessed that they were foreigners and temporary residents on the earth. Now those who say such things make it clear that they are seeking a homeland. If they were thinking about where they came from, they would have had an opportunity to return. But they now desire a better place, a heavenly one. Therefore, God is not ashamed to be called their God, for he has prepared a city for them. By faith, Abraham, when he was tested, offered up Isaac. He received the promises, and yet he was offering his one and only son, the one to whom it had been said, your offspring will be traced through Isaac. He considered God to be able even to raise someone from the dead, 
Therefore he received him back, speaking figuratively. By faith Isaac blessed Jacob and Esau concerning things to come. By faith Jacob, when he was dying, blessed each of the sons of Joseph, and he worshipped, leaning on the top of his staff. By faith Joseph, as he was nearing the end of his life, mentioned the exodus of the Israelites and gave instructions concerning his bones. By faith Moses, after he was born, was hidden by his parents for three months because they saw the child was beautiful and they didn't fear the king's edict. By faith Moses, when he had grown up, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter and chose to suffer with the people of God rather than to enjoy the fleeting pleasures of sin. For he considered reproach for the sake of Christ to be greater than the wealth of the treasures of Egypt, since he was looking ahead to the reward. By faith he left Egypt behind, not being afraid of the king's anger. For Moses persevered as one who sees him who is invisible. By faith he instituted the Passover and the sprinkling of the blood, so that the destroyer of the firstborn might not touch the Israelites. By faith they crossed the Red Sea as though they were on dry land. When the Egyptians attempted to do this, they were drowned. By faith the walls of Jericho fell down after being marched around by the Israelites for seven days. By faith Rahab, the prostitute, welcomed the spies in peace and didn't perish with those who disobeyed. And what more can I say? Time is too short for me to tell about Gideon, Barak, Samson, Jephthah, David, Samuel, and the prophets, who by faith conquered kingdoms, administered justice, obtained promises, shut the mouths of lions, quenched the raging of fire, escaped the edge of the sword, gained strength in weakness, became mighty in battle, and put foreign armies to flight. Women received their dead, raised to life again. Other people were tortured, not accepting release so that they might gain a better resurrection. Others experienced mockings and scourgings, as well as bonds and imprisonment. They were stoned, they were sawed in two, they died by the sword, they wandered about in sheepskins, in goatskins, destitute, afflicted, and mistreated. The world was not worthy of them. They wandered in deserts and on mountains, hiding in caves and holes in the ground. All these were approved by their faith, but they did not receive what was promised, since God had provided something better for us, so that they would not be made perfect without us. A special thank you to Judy T. for an incredible reading of Hebrews chapter 11. Uh, Thank you so much, and What an incredible passage in Scripture, and and what incredible thoughts on faith. So today, I kind of want to conclude this sermon series on faith, looking at three things based on Hebrews chapter 11. Number one, what it's not. Uh, Number two, what it is. And number three, how can we access this idea of faith, and, and how can we grow in our faith towards God? So number one, what it's not. This idea of faith. What isn't faith? Because, uh, you know, sometimes it's easier to start where it's not versus kind of defining what it is. But the first thought that I kind of want to explore with you today is that faith is not solely a mental exercise. That faith, the faith that's described in Hebrews chapter 11, it doesn't end between the ears. In fact, faith, faith in God in Hebrews chapter 11, what is not, it's it's not a collection of irrefutable God facts that's held in our head, that must be defended and argued with those who may think differently. It's, it's, not, it's not that. Because sometimes when we think about faith, when we hear the words defending the faith, we often think that what that means is arguing for a certain set of ideals or belief statements that a religious institution has said to be the most important. And if we, if we go there... It, In this particular line of thinking, when someone believes differently or they have an alternative viewpoint, then they, that person, they become the opponent. And it also determines whether that person is in or whether that person is out depending on what they say to believe instead of how they live their life and how they treat others. So reading Hebrews 11 and listening to how Judy read it, I don't believe that this is the kind of faith that is described in this chapter, nor the entire Bible. 
Because faith, faith cannot be simplified. And it cannot be dumbed down to just be about knowledge and what happens in between the ears. Faith can't be just the subscription of a, to a certain set of predefined belief statements. And defending the faith, I, I don't think that it, it, it means making sure everyone believes in the exact same way. Because if that's what faith is, I feel like that faith will eventually become stagnant and stale. Because it can lead towards a lifeless legalism or a fruitless fundamentalism. Because if faith is, if it's just what happens in between the ears, where do we go from there? How does it impact our life and how we love and treat others and the decisions that we make? I think that the faith is described in Hebrews chapter 11. When the author is describing what faith looks like, she tells stories that put meat and bones to the concept of faith. And when we look at these stories in Hebrews chapter 11, I mean, what are the stories that are being told? What does it look like? I mean, how does it play out in someone's life? I mean, there's stories of Noah, of Abraham, of Moses, of Rahab, of David, Samson, and Gideon. I mean, these were individuals who weren't just sitting around thinking about things and writing journal articles. The trust in, their, in the God, the trust that they had in God prompted them to live differently, to live courageously, and to live faithfully. So faith, when we're talking about what faith is not, faith is not just a concept that you think of. It's not, it doesn't end between the ears. The faith that's described in Hebrews 11 is something that's living and active. So what, what else? The second thing that faith is not, in my opinion, in my uh, interpretation and reading of Hebrews chapter 11, is that faith is not certainty. And this is, this is a key element. Faith is not certainty. Because there is an element of ambiguity. There is an element of unknowing about faith. Faith, you, it's, it's, it's not with your sight. It's, it's, it's using other senses. And faith itself, faith, it can't be pinned. It can't even be defined. Modernity, modernism, you know, we've confused, and sometimes we've confused certitude or the mental ascent towards something that is absolutely empirical fact as being the same as faith. But I think the important thing here and what Hebrews 11 says is that faith cannot be proven. You know, I see sometimes article headlines or book titles, and the whole premise of the project is to try to prove that God exists. To prove with irrefutable evidence, with mathematical equations, with, with physics or with numbers, that God is there and that certain events happened. Or I, I don't know if you've ever come across something or an article or a video that is trying to scientifically prove that Moses walked across the Red Sea and, and how it happened. You know, see, these are using modernity to try to, 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 to give certainty to certain elements of faith. But in my opinion, these conversations, they're, they're boring and they're, and they're fruitless because ultimately you cannot prove God. And let me ask you this. If we could prove God with numbers and facts and empirical evidence, and we could really prove that there is a God, this God exists. The question is, would that be a good thing? I mean, there's this poem by uh, Alfred Tennyson. It's called The Ancient Sage. And in this poem, he has this famous line that I love. It goes along the lines with this message. He says, For nothing worth proving can, can be proven. For nothing worth proving can be proven. So, I mean... This idea, it makes people nervous, though, because we like certitude. We like to be certain. We like things black and white. We like to know that we're right and that everyone else is wrong. I mean, people like certainty because it's easy. It's the easier path. I mean, when you have the right answer, there, there's no wrestling. There's no ambiguity. You know where to stand. There is no doubt. There's no dark nights of the soul. I mean, if you're going on an airplane flight and you're there in the, in the waiting room for the, your flight, it always feels better. It's always easier to have a ticket in your hand with your seat number there printed off instead of waiting in standby, hoping that you're going to get on that flight. And, and maybe it'll happen, maybe it won't. But in the realm of spirituality, it is easier to have certainty. 
but it is also it's it's cheap. It's it's not genuine faith. But if we build our faith on certainty and knowing, when something is challenged or our new experience opens up a different way to view something, then we're only setting ourselves up for the whole thing to crumble. There's this book that, uh, that I love and, and I recommend to you. It's called The Sin of Certainty. It's by Peter Inns. And in this book, Peter Inns writes this about certainty. He says, certainty leads to a preoccupation with correct thinking, making sure familiar beliefs are defended and supported at all costs. It reduces the life of faith to century duty. A 24-7 task of pacing the ramparts and scanning the horizon to defend, to fend off incorrect thinking in ourselves and others. A faith like that is stressful and tedious to maintain. Moving towards different ways of thinking, even just trying it on for a while to see how it fits, is perceived as a compromise to faith or as giving up on faith altogether. But nothing could be further from the truth. Aligning faith in God and certainty about what we believe and needing to be right in order to maintain a healthy faith, these do not make for a healthy faith in God. In a nutshell, this is the problem. And this is what I mean by the sin of certainty. Sisters and brothers of faith at Skillman, faith is not certainty. There is an element of ambiguity of, of putting our trust in something. We're not always going to know the right answers. So finally, for today's discussion, and, and of course, I want to say off the bat, this isn't the end of the conversation. Of course, I'm going to disappoint you, as, as Jake says a lot in, in his sermons about talking about big topics, because these are only scratching the surface, and we hope that this prompts further learning and study and discussion. But the last thing today that I'd like to discuss that faith is not is that faith is not a golden ticket. In Hebrews chapter 11, when the author is describing people of faith, she says this towards the end of her chapter in verse 35. But others were tortured, refusing to turn from God in order to be set free. They placed their hope in a better life after the resurrection. Some were jeered at, and their backs were cut open with whips. Others were chained in prisons. Some died by stoning. Some were sawed in half, and others were killed with the sword. Some went, without, some went about wearing skins of sheep and goats, destitute and oppressed and mistreated. They were too good for this world, wandering over deserts and mountains, hiding in caves and holes in the ground. All these people earned a good reputation because of their faith, yet none of them received all that God had promised. My sisters and brothers of faith at Skillman, we need to learn from this text and realize that faith is not a pathway to making life easier. People of faith they don't have a golden ticket. People of faith are not guaranteed to get rich and wealthy and have big houses and nice cars. People of faith won't always close that deal. Things aren't always going to go like they thought. People of faith won't have children, won't always have children that make decisions that they're pleased with. People of faith aren't guaranteed that life will be easy. I mean, we can see that in the text that we read. This having an easy life isn't a part of being a person of faith. Because we know, because we've lived life, that life itself, it, it has its ups and it has its downs. Life, there's trials and there's wins and losses. There's successes and failures. But people of faith are those that during those times, they use that faith, that trust, as a tool to weather these storms and these seasons. Faith and having eyes that are fixed on Jesus. It gives resilience. It gives purpose and it gives meaning to the mountains and the valleys, to the good times and the bad times, to the winds 
and also the losses. This is what, what faith is. Faith is not a golden ticket. There are challenges, but faith is that tool that walks us through these hard times. So now that we've talked about what faith is not, let's talk about maybe some definitions of what it is. What is faith? Well, as I preached about before, you know, the word in Greek for, for that's defined as faith is pistis. And this, of course, can be translated as faith, as trust, as, as faithfulness. And, and personally, because, because of the connotations that the word faith has with just knowledge and the mental exercise, I do feel like the other definitions, the other two definitions of trust and faithfulness, they could be more accurate depictions of the faith that's described in Hebrews chapter 11 and throughout the entire New Testament. Because faith is trust. Trust is a fantastic word to define what faith is. Faith is a childlike trust in the God whom Jesus taught us to call Father. Faith is an orientation of the soul towards God in the form of deep trust. Again, the author Pete Enns, I mean, he's been on fire recently, and uh, when I read this, it really spoke to me. But this is what he says about faith in the lens of trust. Faith is not so much defined by what we believe, but in whom we trust. In fact, faith has been misunderstood as a what word rather than a who word, as primarily beliefs rather than primarily as trust in. So faith, if we're going to define what faith is, faith has to be defined as an element of trust. And trust Trust requires an intimacy with whom we put our trust in. It's a relational word. In Hebrews chapter 11, it does speak of Enoch. And Enoch is described as having an intimacy with God, walking with God. I mean, I wouldn't trust a stranger that I just meet on the street to take care of my life savings. But of course, with my wife, Tara, whom I've lived years with, and there's, so, there's intimacy, I wouldn't give it a second thought. There's that trust that's there with intimacy. This is why intimacy with God is such an important component to faith. But it also it impacts how we feel about it. But that's also not just the end of trust. Trust, or, uh, a pistis, a faith. Pistis also, I think, could, could mean a faithfulness. That's the second definition. I think it's a great word to describe because, because faithfulness is a verb. And faithfulness, it, it describes, it, it connotes its, its action and, and a certain lifestyle. And I believe how faith is described in Hebrews. It's more like how we, in today's world, how we would understand that word, faithfulness. Because we know that life is, is going to have its ups and its downs. It's going to have its wins, and there are going to be losses. But faith, faith as described in Hebrews 11, is being faithful through it all. That is what faith is. A word that supports this idea is perseverance. Faithfulness is perseverance. Faithfulness is playing the long game. It's like a marathon runner or a distance racer who has his eyes fixed on the finish line, taking a step at a time, not going fast, but just being consistent. That is a great depiction of what faith is. And it's also an, an, a metaphor that's used in Hebrews 11. And if you see some of the stories that we see in Hebrews 11, I mean, they, didn't, they weren't short events. They, some of them lasted decades. But the person of faith continued to be faithful, taking one step at a time. So my friends, now we talk about what faith is not, what it is, how do we get it? How can we arrive at this? Well, again, there's no way to totally cover this topic in, in 20 minutes, 25 minutes. And honestly, there isn't an epistem epistemological, honestly, there isn't a three-step method or a, a five-step pathway that will guarantee faith. Because faith, it, it's more like the results of experience. You have to experience, I think Jesus, when getting his disciples. He didn't come up with like a, a five-step you know, argument. He, what he did is he said, come and see. But the author of, of Hebrews concludes the 11th chapter with a few verses that really occur in Hebrews chapter 12. But I think these two verses in Hebrews 12 sum up the entire idea of how can we obtain, how can we become people of faith, and how can we grow in our faith. So like we did many times at Skillman when we were preaching this, uh, I'm going to put this, the text on the screen. And I'd love to invite you to read this text with me. And this text is from Hebrews chapter 12, 
uh, verses 1 through 2. Therefore, we also, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which so easily ensnares us, and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us. Looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and has sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. My sisters and brothers of faith at Skillman, what a joy it has been to study this word faith, and may we be people of faith. May we grow in our faith. May we have intimacy with God. May we have perseverance. May we fix our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of faith, or the finisher of faith. Let us learn from Jesus and from the teachings of Jesus, especially during this time of ambiguity, of uncertainty. This is when we need to focus our eyes not on the news cycles or the political games, but on our Savior and Jesus who it says in Hebrews 12, endured the cross, despising the shame, and has sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Let's pray together. God, we pray that we can be people of faith, that we can grow in our faith. We don't want faith just to be a set of beliefs that we subscribe to, or just a mental exercise. We don't want to assume that we can fully understand that faith can be proven, that can be certain. And we know, Father, that faith is not a a golden ticket to make our life easier. We know that life will be hard. We know that there will be ups and there will be downs. There will be times of ambiguity, uncertainty, just like that we are experiencing now. But it's during those times where we ask that our faith can bring us through, can carry us through, that we can be faithful, that we we don't lose heart, but that we take steps closer to intimacy with you, to trust in your word and orient our lives on your promises. We are so grateful because this gives us meaning, it gives us purpose, and it it gives us hope. And we pray all this in your son's holy and precious name. Amen. God bless you, people of faith. Let's go.